This section of the book is on moments of inertia. Um, you may not have heard of moments of inertia, but they're very important for uh, many engineering problems, many physics problems. You have a solid object and it's rotating around an axis. And w if the solid is rigid, so then you know, maybe the solid goes around the axis. It makes one revolution in five seconds. Well, that means every single point in the object made one revolution in five seconds. And so we say they all have the same angular velocity. Um, it's different from the ordinary velocity or even speed, right? Because points farther away from the axis travel a greater distance when they go around. So their speed has to be, their absolute speed has to be greater. But what's constant for all the points in the, in the solid is this angular velocity or provided the angular velocity is constant, what's uniform throughout the solid is this um, angular velocity. So for rotating objects, it's, um, it's much more convenient to describe physics in terms of kind of angular velocity. And moment of inertia kind of plays the role of mass when you're, in a sense, for spinning objects. Um, it's, um, we have a mild terminology problem in that if a, the words rotation and revolution are sometimes used interchangeably in English, in physics and certainly in astronomy, they have very fixed meanings. Um, you say an object is rotating around an axis if the axis passes through the object and is revolving around an axis if the axis doesn't pass through the object. So uh, if you're wondering why I say rotate sometimes and revolve other times, that's the reason. It's really not terribly important that you distinguish between those two terms. Um, so what happens? You've got this solid object rotating around an axis. Let me just picture a ball, a solid ball, because it's one of the easiest things for me to draw. And maybe it's rotating around the z-axis. Well, we would like to analyze the physics of the situation, but we'll think of the solid ball as being chopped up into a bunch of little infinitesimal pieces, so point masses. And first you have to analyze the point mass case, and then you integrate to put the point mass case, well, to put the pieces back together and go from the point mass case to the, to the case of a solid object. So, First we want to, we were talking about a rotating solid mass, but now we just want a, a revolving, because the axis won't pass through a point mass. Here's a point mass of some mass m, and we'll assume it stays a constant distance r from, from the axis of now revolution. And I don't really care whether it's rotating clockwise or counterclockwise, but I guess I'll indicate <laughs> indicate that it's traveling um, counterclockwise as you look down from the positive z-axis, always staying a, a constant distance r from the axis. All right. Well, what? What's the physics of this situation? Well, first of all, if it's staying in a plane, and I do mean it's staying in a plane perpendicular to the axis, then um, we might as well investigate this situation in the xy plane. So you might as well kind of forget the three-dimensional picture for a minute and just suppose, oh, you've got a point mass. So here's m. Here's some distance r. And the point is now revolving around the origin, staying a constant distance r. So traveling in a circle. Um, of course, then it would seem completely natural to call this angle theta. We use polar coordinates, call that angle theta. And you get the x and y coordinates of the position at any time. The position at any time would just be r times the cosine of theta times the sine of theta. In the xy plane, if you wanted to consider this the copy of the xy plane in 3 space, so in xyz space, which really is how I started the problem, something moving in space, you can put on a z coordinate of 0. Then what's the velocity vector? 
Okay, the velocity vector, you have to be a little careful. We are differentiating with respect to t. But r is a constant, so that just goes along for the ride. But you will get minus the sine of theta times d theta dt. The cosine of theta times d theta dt. And zero. So you can pull out the d theta dt. You get r times d theta dt times minus the sine of theta cosine of theta, zero. This is a unit vector, and its, it's magnitude is one, the square root of the sum of the squares. So the speed, ah, maybe before I say that, this, this quantity, this is what we're calling the angular velocity, d theta dt, angular velocity. It is usually denoted by omega, a, a lowercase omega. So now, now let me go on. So we get the speed, the magnitude of the velocity is, well, r is positive. So we get r, we get the magnitude of d theta dt and the, the absolute value of d theta dt. And then we'd multiply times the magnitude of this vector, but that's one. So you just get this relationship between the speed and the angular velocity. This is r times the absolute value of omega. And then, if you look at the kinetic energy of the mass, of the, object, of the point mass, kinetic energy, it's, you probably know, it's one half mv squared. Really here, v should be the speed, so we'll put the magnitude of the velocity squared. But in terms of r and omega, that's one half m r squared omega squared. So if you're trying to specify things in terms of kinetic energy, in terms of, of omega, the angular velocity, then this quantity m r squared is playing, well, it, it becomes important. And instead of having one half m v squared, you'd have one half this quantity times omega squared. And this that makes this quantity important, and we call this the moment of inertia. It's also called um, rotational inertia. I, I won't use this term much, maybe occasionally. But it's also called the rotational inertia. Some people, every now and then, you see it called the second moment of inertia. We'll just call it the moment of inertia. Um, inertia is kind of the resistance of something to, um, acceler or to accelerating, um, to, to moving. And um, you know what, what's going on here is, oh, this would mean to increase the kinetic energy of a point mass while it's revolving around an axis if you want to have it, um, if you want it to uh, rot revolve around the axis at a fixed omega, it takes more, you have to put in more kinetic energy if I is bigger. So in that sense, it's, it's resistance to moving in that, yeah, if you want the point mass to move with a given angular velocity, then a bigger I means you have to put in more energy to do it. All right, so that's the point mass case. Of course, what do we do for a solid object? We think of it as being chopped up into lots of little point masses of infinitesimal size, of infinitesimal mass dm. So for a solid object, And I could say occupying a region S in space, but I'm going to blur the distinction between the name of the solid object in the region, or the solid object in the region it occupies. For a solid object S, the I, the moment of inertia,
is you take the triple integral over s of r squared dm, the moment of inertia about an axis, I should say about an axis, equals, it's just this, where r equals the distance to the axis for any point in your solid region S. So it's a function of x, y, and z, and it's the distance to the given axis. You would have different moments of inertia about different axes distance to the axis. So that's what you do. We do this for solid objects. You need to calculate this triple integral. Um, you could also do this in two dimensions. Uh, let me hold off on doing that until I kind of describe the standard situation, which is for constant density. So let me do that first. You will find, you can find tables of moments of inertia for various solid objects, and somebody's just calculated the right triple integrals, but they always assume constant dense density. Now, you don't have to do that, but it's the standard assumption in all of those tables. So you've got this quantity that you want to calculate. Well, if you were given the density function, as we've looked at in the last two sections, you would just put, oh, the density function times dv. So if you're given the density function, you'd have to integrate the density times dv because that's what dm is. Right? A little chunk of mass is the density times a little chunk of volume. But if delta is constant, it's the constant, a constant function, well, if delta is constant, you know what it is. If delta is constant, it's the total mass divided by the total volume. So this is the mass of the solid. And this is the volume of the solid. Well then, in that case, so if delta is constant, you can pull the delta all the way out, and then you get the moment of inertia is you get the m and then times a 1 over v times the triple integral over s of r squared dv. And if you look at this, here we're integrating over solid region. We integrate something times dv and we divide by v. This is the average value of r squared. So the average value of distance squared to the axis. Right? And so it's just m, the total mass of the object, times the average value of the radius squared. And the reason I held off on doing what happens for a planar region is you get the same thing. But the two-dimensional analog. So if you're thinking of like a thin plate, you're given an area density function, then you would get the mass over the total area. Um, let me write it the same way I wrote that over there. Mass divided by the total area, but then you'd integrate over the two-dimensional region, r squared times dA, and this again is the average value of r squared. All right, so this is what we want to calculate. We're going to look at three examples. They'll all have constant density, since that's the case we care about. I'm going to do two that you can definitely look up, well, three that you can definitely look up in tables. Not, not, I mean, not because you shouldn't look in tables if you need these things, but to let you know where the tables come from and so that if you encounter something that's not in the tables, you know what you have to do to get the entry. So, all right. First, let's do a spinning disk. So, example.
let's take a thin metal plate of radius A. So a, th a thin metal disc of radius A. So, so a thin, thin, so idealized two-dimensional object, a thin disc of constant density and radius A. And I want to find its moment of inertia about an axis perpendicular to the disk passing through the center. All right, um, fine. But I'm going to picture my disk in the xy plane so it's easier for me to say, find the moment of inertia. About the z-axis. Okay, this is a, a straightforward problem. The moment of inertia, it has, we have constant density. You will take the mass divided by the total area and integrate over, call this region R, and integrate over R, R squared times dA. Of course, this is going to be nicest in polar coordinates or cylindrical coordinates, pretending that there's a Z that we care about. Z is zero, so you might as well call it polar coordinates. Well, you get M, the total mass, divided by um, disk of constant density. Constant density with mass M. Let's do this with mass. So I'm assuming you're given the total mass. mass this is what you find in the tables. They assume you know, the tables all refer to the total mass of the object. Um, the area is pi times the radius squared, which is a squared. And we'll switch to polar coordinates, so dA is r dr d theta. Theta goes all the way around from 0 to 2 pi. R goes from 0 to a. And so you get And so you get I is, what is that? You get I is M over A times the integral from 0 to 2 pi. The integral from 0 to A of R cubed dr d theta. This is, oops, I'd already put in that this is pi over A squared. So we get M over pi times a squared. And then you get the integral from 0 to 2 pi, the integral of r cubed, r to the fourth over 4. You evaluate from 0 to a, and you still have to integrate with respect to theta, which will give you an extra multiple of 2 pi. So we'll get, we get m over pi a squared times a to the fourth over 4 times 2 pi, you can cancel the pi's. Uh, you can cancel an a squared. You can cancel a 2. And all we end up with is 1 half ma squared for the moment of inertia of a thin metal plate, a thin circular plate um, about an axis perpendicular to the plate um, through its center. All right, that was easy. Let's do another example. Um, still relatively easy, but, but a 3D example and one that's slightly more complicated. Well, we just did a disc. Might as well do a, a solid ball. So again, I'm going to use my axis I'm going to use for my axis, the z-axis. I'm going to assume I've got some ball called ball B for ball. So 
a, a solid, you know, a filled-in sphere, a ball. Um, I'm going to call the radius, now this R doesn't mean region, the radius of the ball is R, and I want to find, I'm going to assume constant density, which will be the mass over the volume, which will be the mass over 4 thirds pi r cubed. And we want to find the moment of inertia about the z-axis. So we get I equals our constant density times the triple integral over B of R squared times dV. Now you might think we're going to use spherical coordinates, that spherical coordinates would be nice. But R is the distance to the z-axis, which is the R in cylindrical coordinates. So for that reason, it is nicest to set this up in cylindrical coordinates, even though our, our object looks very spherical. You know, it's the inside of a sphere. Nonetheless, cylindrical coordinates will be nice. So for cylindrical coordinates, so we'll have z on the inside. Our projected region in the xy plane will be this disk of radius r, capital R. Um, so we will integrate, I will have an r squared, there'd be a dz, an r dr, let me put the r on the inside, so an r dz, dr d theta, theta will go from zero to two pi, little r will certainly go from zero to capital R, z, all right, well, you should know what z does, but this is, we are looking at x squared plus y squared plus z squared. The boundary of this, the sphere, is this. x squared plus y squared is r squared. So this is r squared. And so what does your z coordinate do? Well, you solve for z. You get z is plus or minus the square root of capital R squared minus little r squared. So for any point in the projected region, your z coordinate starts down here at negative the square root of r squared minus little r and goes up here to plus to positive. So we have negative the square root of r squared minus little r squared to positive the square root of r squared minus r squared. All right. Um, this integral is not particularly difficult. It will involve a substitution, but hey, we know how to do substitutions. So we get I is M over 4 thirds pi R cubed. We get the integral from 0 to 2 pi, the integral from 0 to A, um, uh, 0 to R. And then we get, we get an R cubed Z we get r cubed z, where z goes from negative the square root of r squared minus r squared to positive the square root of r squared minus r squared. And after that, we still have to integrate with respect to r and with respect to theta. So we get m over 4 thirds pi r cubed. The integral from 0 to 2 pi, the integral from 0 to r of, well, you get, you plug in this for z, you subtract what you get when you plug in this, you get the same thing but with a minus sign, but you're subtracting it, so you get 2 times r cubed times the square root of capital R squared minus little r squared dr d theta. How do you integrate this? Well, you make a substitution. Let me first put in. This is to the one half. All right. So, what substitution do we want? Let's let 
u equal capital R squared minus little r squared. So du is minus 2r dr. So I'll pull off one of those r's. Um, we'll also use that r squared then is capital R squared minus u. So what do we get? This is good practice from single variable calculus with in integrating by substitution. I'm going to do this. Let me go ahead and get rid of this other integral. This is some function of little r when we integrate. There are no thetas. And when we plug this in, we'll get a function of capital R. It'll be a constant inside the integral from 0 to 2 pi of d theta. So you can just pull that out, and you'll end up multiplying by a 2 pi. So I'm going to go ahead and multiply by that 2 pi from the integral from 0 to 2 pi of d theta. For that matter, I'll go ahead and grab this 2 so that so I'm getting a 4 pi. And I'm left with, it just uncomplicates the rest of what I'm writing. And we have an r cubed times r capital R squared minus little r squared, 1 half dr. Um, really, to make things nice, I'll go ahead and put this 3 up here. I'll cancel the 4 pi's. All right, things look much better. 3m over r cubed times whatever this integral is. But what do we get for this? So we get 3m over r cubed. And then what do you do? This integral becomes, all right, we took one of these r's, and you write it over here with the r dr. r squared, little r squared, becomes capital R squared minus just u. This becomes u to the 1 half. Right? r squared minus r is u, so this is u to the 1 half. R dr is, oh, I should have left one of those twos. R dr is minus a half, is minus a half du. And I need R dr, put that minus two over here. Um, and we might as well switch our limits of integration on the definite integral. This started when little r is zero. When little r is zero, u is capital R squared. When little r is capital R, um, u is 0. OK, so we have to do this integral. But this isn't bad at all. We get, I'm tempted not to finish this. This is a calculus, a single variable calculus problem. But we want the answer. We'd like to know that it agrees with what you find in tables. So let's go ahead and do it. It's also nice to know kind of how hard these are, although, you know, there are different ways to do this. We could have tried spherical coordinates. Um, 3m over r cubed, and all right, I'm going to pull out that half. So I'm going to pull out the half. I'm going to use the minus sign to reverse the order of integration so, so that things look better to me. And then I'm going to distribute what's inside. So we have a capital R squared times u to the 1 half. Capital R squared times u to the 1 half minus u to the 3 halves. And we're integrating with respect to u. Phew. We get 3m over 2r cubed times. And then we get u squared times u to the 3 halves over 3 halves, minus u to the 5 halves over 5 halves, evaluated as u goes from 0 to r squared. This is getting exciting now. So we get 3m over 2r cubed. 3m over 2r cubed, you get a 2 thirds. All right, you get a 2 thirds. Here's r squared. Plugging in r squared for u, but you take the square roots, you get r cubed. So you get r to the fifth. Two thirds r to the fifth. Then you invert this, you get minus two fifths. And then you, you take the square root and raise to the fifth, minus two fifth r to the fifth. All right. So we get 3m over 2r cubed times. All right, I'm factoring out an r to the fifth. Two-thirds minus two-fifths. This is ten-fifteenths minus six-fifteenths, so four-fifteenths. 
right? Let's check that again. 10 fifteenths minus 6 fifteenths, 4 fifteenths, r to the fifth. And finally, you cancel an r cubed with an the cute, well, maybe I'll write a new line. So what do we get? We get an M, we get an R squared, and right, so we get an R squared, we get an M, and the constant out in front, we cancel a two, so you end up with a two, and then you cancel it, so it looks like a two-fifths, two-fifths MR cubed, uh, squared, MR squared, two-fifths MR squared which is what we're supposed to get, because I know what the tables say. Phew. All right. I'd like to do one more. Um, I know this looks a little complicated, but the complication wasn't setting it up. It was just doing the integral, and even that wasn't that complicated. It was one substitution. It's just you know, a triple integral with a substitution. They look a little messy. I'd like to do one more. Um, it presents a mild notational problem because the integral is nicest to set up in cylindrical coordinates, but the r of cylindrical coordinates won't be the distance to the axis that we're rotating around. So, but aside from that, the problem is not bad. So, example, I want to take a cylinder A solid cylinder. So if the radius is very small, you could think of this as a metal rod, uh, kind of a, almost a one-dimensional object, but here's a, a solid cylinder, I believe, to match my notation in the book that I need the check. I need the height to be the height, the length of the rod be L, and the radius to be, that doesn't look very circular, the radius to be A. So a solid cylinder of radius A and height L. Um, what's the problem? Well, we have a notational problem. It's a cylindrical solid. It's nicest to integrate over this in cylindrical coordinates if it's set up this way. But if it's set up, oh, I didn't say where we want to revolve around. So set it up this way. Find the moment of assume constant density. Find the moment of inertia about the y-axis. So, I mean, set up the way I've got it. Without referring to a specific axis, you could say about an axis parallel to one of the ends crossing through a diameter, but that takes a long time to say. Find the moment of inertia about the y-axis. So why don't I set this up, maybe so that it circles the y-axis, encircles the y-axis, and then find the moment of inertia about the z-axis. That would be the same problem. I could set it up so that my, my cylinder is here, and we should get the same answer if we find the moment of inertia of this cylinder about the z-axis as if we find the moment of inertia of that cylinder about the y-axis. Why not set it up that way? Because then polar coordinates would refer to, well, would be set up wrong, and we'd need for polar coordinates then to refer to x and z, so cylindrical coordinates, what would normally be our z would now be the y, and what we'd normally do, what we'd put in terms of r and theta would be x and z. So it's a choice. It's do we abandon calling the distance to the axis of rotation r, or do we abandon r in our, as meaning um, distance to the z-axis like we're used to. So I'm going to set it up like this, but that means <coughs> the distance squared to the y-axis, well, for any point in space, 
distance to the y-axis is the square root of the x-coordinate squared plus the y-coordinate squared, uh, plus, the, sorry, the x-coordinate squared plus the z-coordinate squared. So after you square it, this distance is x squared plus z squared. <coughs> That's the distance to the y-axis. Okay, um, so where we normally have r squared in the moment of inertia formula, I'm just going to put in x squared plus z squared because r, I want r to refer to the r in cylindrical coordinates. So I'm going to call this solid region S. It's, um, what's this constant density? Well, it's the total mass divided by the volume. The volume is pi times the radius squared times the length or height, whichever you want to call it. We call it L. So our density is this, and our moment of inertia then is you pull out that density, so you have M over pi a squared L, and you take the triple integral over S, and what's normally R squared, distance squared to the axis of rotation, um, but I'm going to put in x squared plus y squared, x squared plus z squared, I don't know why I keep saying that, x squared plus z squared dv. So this is what we want to calculate, um, but I am going to switch into cylindrical coordinates, so z will stay as z, but x becomes r cosine of theta, and of course dv becomes dz times r dr d theta. So, but aside from that, it's not too bad. It's um, kind of interesting, the moment of inertia kind of naturally breaks up into two parts. But we'll see that. So we need i equals m over pi a squared l. All right, cylinders are easy in cylindrical coordinates. Our z coordinate will go from 0 to L. Our r will go from 0 to A, and our theta will go all the way around from 0 to 2 pi. And then where we had x squared in cylindrical coordinates, x is r cosine of theta. So we have r squared cosine squared theta. Um, z squared is just z squared, and then we have a dz and a dz and an r dr d theta, but I'll put the r here, a dz dr d theta. So yeah, we have to do this. Um, you get m over pi a squared l. Um, you get the integral from 0 to 2 pi, integral from 0 to a. Uh, I'll go ahead and multiply this r here, so we'll get an r cubed and then rz squared. Okay, so you go ahead and integrate this, you get r cubed cosine squared theta times z plus rz cubed over 3, and this is evaluated as z goes from 0 to L, and then you have to integrate with respect to r, and then you have to integrate with respect to theta. So we get m pi a squared over L times the integral from 0 to 2 pi, and the integral from 0 to a. We plug in z as L, we get L times r cubed cosine squared theta plus l cubed over 3 times r. Um, then you plug in z is 0, but you get 0 both places, so this is what we've got. We still have to integrate with respect to r and then with respect to theta. So what do we get? Yeah, we'll see. All right, you get the m pi a squared over l. You get the integral from, I don't know why that happened. You probably noticed this. I didn't until just now. There was a 2 pi here. Why did it mysteriously become a pi? Because I made a mistake. It's 
I don't know why that changed. I just noticed as I was about to rewrite the integrals. Mm. All right. So we get the integral from 0 to 2 pi. The integral from, ah, no, I'm going to do this one. So we get L cosine squared theta times, we have to integrate r cubed with respect to 4, so, uh, with respect to r, so we get r to the 4th over 4. L cosine squared r to the 4th over 4 plus L cubed over 2, L cubed over 3 times r squared over 2, and we're evaluating this as r goes from 0 to a. And we still have to integrate with respect to theta. When r is 0, you get 0, so we just get what you get when you plug in a. So maybe just to speed things up a little bit, to write less, I'm just going to plug in r equals a. So I'll say it again, what you get at 0 is 0. So what we're getting here is an a to the fourth and an a squared right there. All right, so this is 1 sixth L cubed A squared. All right, so what do we get? Well, we have to integrate cosine squared still, but this naturally splits up into two pieces. There's, so, um, I'm going to put this piece first. This is a constant, and you can pull it out. I mean, splitting the integral up is a sum. We can pull that part out and get 1 sixth L cubed A squared, and then the integral from 0 to 2 pi of theta, you just get times 2 pi. But then we'll have plus this other part. Um, the L over A to the 4, L times A to the 4th over 4 is a constant, but we still have to integrate from 0 to 2 pi cosine squared. How do you integrate cosine squared? The easiest way is to use a trig identity. Cosine squared is the same as 1 plus cosine of 2 theta over 2. Um, so we need to do this. You can pull out this 2 and get an 8 here. And so we need to integrate this. So you get an m times pi a squared over times l. Then you get, all right, a 1, let's see, there's a 2 pi, so we get a 1 third pi l cubed a squared. I don't want to screw up now. 1 third l cubed a squared plus you get an l a to the fourth over 8 times. And then this, you get theta plus the sine of 2 theta over 2, evaluated as theta goes from 0 to 2 pi. When you plug in 2 pi, you get 2 pi and then minus 0, and at 0 you get 0, so you just get a 2 pi from that. And so we get m times pi a squared over l, times one third pi L cubed A squared, plus we pick up another two pi, so one of the twos will cancel with here, we get a pi L A to the fourth, pi L A to the fourth over four. All right, <laughs> lots of opportunities for small mistakes. I tried to be careful, we'll see if this matches with I know we're supposed to get. First of all, we can cancel a pi everywhere. We can cancel an L everywhere. We can cancel an A squared everywhere. And what we end up with is one-third ML squared plus one-fourth m a squared. Now I have to check whether that's really what you're supposed to get. Yes! It looks like I made no mistakes or none that mattered, or I made some mistakes and they canceled out. This is what you get. One-third m l squared plus one-fourth m a squared. Um, 
it's very non-obvious to me. One important point is that, yeah, if you look in the tables, you'll also find um, the rotational inertia of an idealized, just one-dimensional narrow rod. So for all practical purposes, it has one dimension. Well, that's what we would get if we took the radius of our cylinder to be zero. Well, you can do that now. Think, take the limit as A approaches zero. This part will go away. And what you'll find in the tables for the rotational inertia, or the, uh, I said it, the moment of inertia of a thin rod about an axis at one end is one third ml squared. So it's not a coincidence that that part is there. It's just what you get as you take the limit. Um, those are all the examples I want to do. Moments of inertia, as you can see, are well, they're not so awful to calculate, but it's a little time consuming. You know, there are, there are tables of these things, but this is where the tables come from. And if you do have some region for which you need the moment of inertia, and it's not in the tables, you can't break it up into things that are in the tables, this is what you have to do.